My name is Chris Michael, and um, I can slide over. I work at a, a human rights organization called Witness, and for 20 years we've trained human rights defenders how to use video for advocacy work. Um, and in the process of, you know, one, we are, we're based in Brooklyn, uh, and many of us have a strong affinity for the Occupy movement. Um, but also a lot of us travel a lot, so you haven't seen our faces all that much. Um, but the, the process of um, what we're seeing with the Occupy movement and police brutality, it's you know, very intentional at this point, it seems. Um, and there's a lot of cameras that are out there. Some of the gaps in what's coming from the media is a lot conduct, behavior, abuse, etc. Um, and to try to do that, you know, we've created these uh, tips, which I will pass around later. Um, but uh, we're going to go over some of the ways in which to get this. One of the main challenges that we've seen is that how many of you have seen a police officer maybe shove someone or push someone back or say someone to come back, right? Most of us. And in that, how many of you have seen video cameras around, right? How many of you have noticed video cameras away from that, getting it from a different perspective? A few, right? This is one of the major issues we're finding because, if Chris, if you could pop up here. So, Chris is a, you know, a police officer and he's pushing me, right? To switch. Go ahead and push me. Push me back. All of you are filming, right? But there's usually no one back here that's actually capturing what the police formation is or what the police are doing. What that means for two different major issues, for two different major issues, what that means is we have a challenge on you're you're getting shaky footage often because you're getting moved as you're filming it. So it's you're getting shaky footage, but also often what the police are doing is they're creating formations and they have to follow specific orders as they form. And what you're seeing is police are then targeting people that are not getting the attention of video cameras, that are getting swooped up and picked up. So you're losing the aspect of evidence that you could get to get the whole situation. So one of the things we want to focus on today, we're going to talk about three main things, right? Filming best practices, generally. It's going to be great. Super fun, super easy. The second one is working in teams and the importance of working in a team with film, uh, especially at direct actions and demonstrations. And the third is really going to be focused on getting evidentiary related footage to build on the efficacy of video that you're capturing. Does that sound good? Okay. Um, so let's start with general filming tips. All right. Uh, how many of you film with your mobile phone? Yeah. Okay. One of the hardest things to do, right, is to hold our mobile phone steady. So I'm filming. What could I do to hold my shot better? Any ideas? Brace your arms. Maybe like this, yeah? Tucking your elbows in, right? What else could I do? You could balance it on something. You could balance it on something, right? We could, pardon, we could come over here and we could set it steady on a ledge, right? What else could we do? Lean it against another person. Lean it against another person. One of my favorites, this move right here. Hold it up against the tree. Hold it against the wall. You're going to get a flat angle on a camera, right? Any other ideas? Yes. Arguably the most important tool. Now, filming with a tripod in public in New York City, uh, just like using a megaphone, is a challenge, right? It's illegal. You have to have a permit. But it doesn't seem, as I know, and I've asked, I'm trying to get specific legal advice on this, but these are called monopods. Are you all familiar with monopods? The beauty of monopods is you can put any camera on, right? But you get a reach that's quite marvelous. And a couple things are great. No matter how tall you are, you can hold it steady, right? But another thing, so this is kind of like bracing, you can relax, it's really nice. But even a little bit more importantly, one of the challenges we have when we film is staying steady. But one of the things we can do we can actually use it as a brace because this is a $30 investment that will save you and create really good footage. So this is a $20, it's called a GIF, Glyph, 
and it pops on in a very simple way and it enables you to record with your mobile phone this connection is 20 bucks so together this is fifty dollars and it's you can get really high quality footage um, you can get these kind of anywhere one of the things about it if you have a, a bigger camera with a phone a strap you can strap it and use that strap as a brace to hold your shot even steadier am I talking too fast by the way okay just let me know right yeah. As of yet, there hasn't been a discussion on it, tripods. So, uh, and what I would suggest is we use it as long as we possibly can until they say we can. And here's why. All of this is very important for steady footage. But I'll tell you what's more important. Can I get a few volunteers? Any volunteers? Okay. Come and stand up in here, please. All right. Now, do I have the permission to touch you all? All right. So, Chris, do me a favor. Now, here. You know what? We're going to come over here. Can we come over here as a group? You and I are going to be activists. Please, if you mind. Start shoving us back. And Chris, you're coming. Chris is filming. Now, we're getting pushed back. Look at the camera. Right? It's going all over the place. No. It's going all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Push back. <laughs> so, as they're getting pushed back, right? As I'm holding the camera, you know what this one is. What's happening is this footage is shaking this footage. What's more important than that is you're only getting maybe one or two officers. You're not getting a full picture. So as you're coming back, what I could be doing is come back here to have to the full live stream. Uh, with live streaming, with like applications like Bamboozer that you can stream on your iPhone, which is becoming popular, the connection is often slow because it's 3G, and so the feed is slow, so you have to move very slowly to get a visible shot. But uh, with this technique, you're better able to, to keep a steady shot for that purpose. I mean, without it, you couldn't do it, really. So we're going to take that out of the picture, but let's say everybody buys those. I, I really think it's the best $30 investment we can possibly make. But let's say we're using our hands. Can we do that again, please? All right, so I'm filming. I have good form, right? Can I just start filming? So there's no way. Anything I do, I'm not going to do. So there are two things I want to flag up. One, work in a team. Because look at this. Situation A is I'm here alone filming, right? I'm only going to get the shape with everybody else that's up in here. Situation B, someone is here on a ledge, in an office building, in a window, at a dedicated building. They're filming the entire action nonstop, shaking, shaking, not shaking footage, right? So the value of having teams where one person is responsible for getting up close details while another is getting the content. It really changes the dynamic of the threat, where this person can feel comfortable backing up or altering because they don't have to capture the whole. Does this make sense? It's a huge problem that we see. Another oh, the, 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 the advantage too of having uh, person A here, person B above, is that uh, you have uh, the first camera operator in the frame. They can be getting uh, closer details about like officer badge numbers, who's you know who's on the front line. Is there an abuse there? And uh, you can verify that we find a stable camera. Absolutely. Um, how many of you are photographers? Any of you? Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Right? Okay, photographers are arguably more important in many ways because they have zoom capability to get details. How many of you have seen police brutality or abuse while you've been occupied Wall Street? How many of you have got the badge number? or the name of that officer. A few of you, right? But it's hard to get when you're trying to get it on video or close up, right? But a photographer can zoom in and get that person from different angles. It's very important to kind of build evidence when you think about the group of the information that you need to be able to document what's happening. And also if he's you're working together, he's got your back because you can't see what's going on if someone's trying to grab you, so it's good to have some of the buddy system. The buddy system. Can we show you a couple other things with regards to working as a team? How many of you uh, have, have tried to walk and keep steady footage? It's pretty hard, right? It's pretty hard. Have you all ever heard of crab walking? 
So crab walking, when we go back to those tips, when we're holding steady, crab walking is this move here, where you're moving like this. Well, that looks really pretty. I'm kind of a dancer right there because there's no one running at me. But if I have to move fast, I can move fast. But what happens when there are 50, 100 people behind me? It's very hard. So what we want to do is think about working in teams as a spotter. So let me show you an example. So Chris is filming. I'm his spotter, right? I'm responsible for making sure that I'm his eyes where he can't see. If police are coming towards him or identifying him, or if there's a threat, my responsibility is to move him. But also, when something happens in a crowd, I can grab him and ask people to move and give him space so he can keep a steady footage, right? It's very important because it's as you're walking back, you have the ability to fall, but you also aren't going to get strong footage. So working in a team as a spotter can really help us. Um, another aspect is if we have our very nice police officers here. How many of you have been in an act? How many of you have? Um, how many of you have been in an action before in which the police have lined up and there are protesters, either you're blocking an intersection or you're just, you're at a standstill, right? It's kind of common in our work, you know, in our activities, right? So one of the things, can you film police officers in New York? Yes. 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 That's exactly right. You, can you film police officers in every state in the United States? No. 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 Sad reality. But we live in New York, so let's embrace this fact. So what do we do? The reality is, is that police brutality that's occurring most often now is happening in formation type settings. You aren't seeing uh, a situation in which there aren't police lined up as much grabbing somebody and pulling them in as of yet. We're seeing a little bit more of that. But for the most part, the rest people are being picked off by cops in a lineup. So my suggestion to everyone involved in D17 and other actions is to have work in teams and one person is responsible for what? Pop watch. And what specifically with pop watch? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, you can do three main things. One, live streaming is the best because you get an automatic record of it. <laughs> so with live streaming, you're getting a few main things. You're getting the date, the time, the location of this. So again, these are our police officers, right? What one person in the team, sorry, you know, what one, one person in the team can do is do this. You're going in front, you're filming the person, you're holding the shot steady for minimum five seconds per officer. You're getting their face, you're saying into the microphone their name and badge number, and then you're capturing the badge number. You're going to the next one. Name and face, badge number, captured. You go down the line. Almost every action that we have in this kind of um, activity, you have enough time to do that. But why is that important? So they know. Later on, we can spot them in the video. That's right. We were down at um, in November 17th, and we got an uh, image of a cop using a baton on somebody's neck to throw down and hold them down. And we actually got the uh, badge number off of his hat, right? But the, there was one cop in particular that was responsible for grabbing his eyes and pulling him back. And there was no footage that we could find that captured who that person was, that cop was. It was un indis indistinguishable. So the reality is, is that we have to correlate footage. So this is going to help to be able to ensure that you know who the cops are on scene. So another major thing, always ask, who is the commanding officer present? Right? If you're at an intersection, if you're at an action, who's in charge? And those are the people that give the information for what are the commands or the orders or the permissions. You want a record of that with your notes. And again, your notes can be verbally and via visual on your on your phone, but that does get stolen. Optimal is live stream or tape. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do they have to tell you? Yes. Yeah. When they don't tell you, what do you do? Just keep asking. But well, I mean, it's a bad advice. But, um, it's up to you. It's up to you. Just what you feel comfortable with. Um, but the reality is, is that there's a command structure, and when you're in situations like this where there's a line. It's important to know who is in charge because that person is going to give the orders of the formation of the activities of those officers. And that's the person you want to see how they're reacting to get a, a tone, a sense of what's happening. But is there any other information we can get besides like, as many names as, as possible? Because a lot of times like the person in charge will be in plain clothes and they won't give their badge number and I've been at a loss as to what to do, especially if the person in plain clothes is the one who's like, you know, Absolutely. The, 
the main thing is what we want to do is we want to capture that as best possible and recognize that that officer refused to give his badge number and information. That documentation is valid because what we're trying to get is a systemic issue of what's happening with police misconduct. And frankly, the Occupy movement is the illustration of that in a systemic way. Um, so this is all going to be used to build up. Now, in summation, what are some things that we that we learned in this little little gathering? Anyone? Race. <laughs> right. Partner. What else? Partner. Partner up. What about partnering? Uh, partner up for better camera stability and visual awesome. and navigation. Yes. What else? So working in teams, if someone is willing to be at a higher risk, for example, if I'm willing to risk arrest and I'm going to be in a, a more jeopardized place, my friend can be far away with a nice zoom or you taking photos to get the whole scene of what's happening, capture the angle from different perspectives. Again, this is police, but guess what? If you're savvy and you know where you're going to be, you have a filmmaker back here filming them from behind. You can have that in various ways. If you know the locations, D17, if you're in an action, you're going to know where you're going to be. Scout it. Know the location. Try to get up high in an office space. These kind of things help a lot. So let's, let's say this is a police baton. You want to know how the police are holding that police baton all the time. Because when one of them moves it, I guarantee you the rest of them are going to be moving it. Where they're holding is an indicator of how they're going to use it on a crowd. So if it's at standstill, you have a sense of what that is. When they bring it up here and start coming, you, you know that it's a it's a behavior that everyone follows through, whether that's a given order from someone or whether it's someone feeling a threat, they're gonna do it. So you wanna capture that. And the way to capture it is not up here where you're only seeing one or two police. You have to have it from beyond in a, in a separate location. Um, yeah. Also, um, I guess the larger Sorry. picture is important because like they pick off people when there's not necessarily like a visible conflict there, so like maybe nobody's watching when they get picked off. So if you have a wide shot, then you can see those things. And if they're not like nobody's yelling like camera or whatever. Yeah, it's a great point, right? Yeah. Um, that was a really good tip about watching their hands and also that there's this herd mentality of like one cop does one thing, the others may follow, and also the level of aggression, it's contagious. Uh, the other thing about hands is they're trained to watch our hands in case we're reaching for a weapon or something. So um, they're, they're watching our hands, so let's watch their hands. And um, also that's important because their hands may be coming for you. <laughs> yeah. It's good to stay out of their reach, not make it easier for them than, you know, so. Um, yeah. Is it at all practical to use cameras that might be hidden in a hat and some other thing, or is that just really... Yep, there's a spy shop up on Fifth Avenue, you can get that stuff. But is it going to be jiggling too much so it's not really yeah. practical, or what's the reality? It's not stable. Not stable enough. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there are a couple of things, right? I love the whole spy stuff. I always wanted to be a spy. <laughs> so the thing, the thing about these is that, for example, I would say, you know, what's a smarter use of spy, if you will, is to actually hold your phone like you're talking in a location. For example, if I'm behind the cops and I'm on the sidewalk dressed differently than protesters, I could film the whole thing without moving for quite some time. That's a simple spy move. A complex spy move is we have cameras that are in bags that you might actually have and literally like duct taped to your shoulder that looks like a bag. But arguably, I don't think you're getting good video quality, but I guarantee you're not getting good audio quality. And that's something I really want to focus on. You know, we have a lot of raw fo uh, protest footage, which is great, but we're losing the audio quality of people talking about what's happening. What are some things we can do if we want to conduct interviews or get audio that we could do to get better audio? Anybody have ideas? If I'm going to film something, uh, it's a very simple tool. There's probably other more effective ones. However, if I'm filming something like this, the sound is coming this way which means that it's going to take, if the, if the microphone's over here, it's getting all the sound over here. Do this with your hand like that, then it isolates the sound to go in like that, and then you microphone like that. Just do that. Very simple, but it works. Great suggestion. If you have the opportunity to plug in a mic, plug in a mic. Oh, it's such a good difference. Um, but also, we can move out from a location that's busy and, la and loud and crowded to a quieter space, right? If you're going to capture something. 
thing is, is we have a lot of footage, but we often aren't understanding what's happened before or after the incident occurred. So if you have people in your affinity group or people that you're working with, you can interview them. Can you tell us what happened before we caught this on footage? And you can build the story. That's good for evidence, right? Understand the value of that. It's not necessarily um, how do you feel about these things, but you can actually get what exactly happened and build up evidence. That can be useful. Um, consent is very important. Letting someone know how that video will be used. Uh, I'm gonna just share a couple other things on the evidentiary side that are really important, okay? So, say I'm filming, right? Before I, I take any clip, I start any clip, what should I do? Time. Time and deep. Yes. yes. What else? Time, date, location. Okay. Uh-huh, so sick. All right, some easy ways to do that. You know, if you have a phone, you're filming a camera, you just record with your phone, but speak it in, right? Second thing, get location, landmarks, street intersections, anything that you can get to capture your exact proximity. If you want to go a step further, you have your, yeah, GPS, right? GPS is crazy. This is where live streaming is a whole new era. Um, you know, I'm a, anyway, that's a side note. But so GPS is really amazing. The GPS other, on your phone? Yeah. You can yeah. Take your video well, you can have, if you're streaming or you uh, are using your phone, you can enable metadata. All of our you know, photos and video we take have metadata, depending upon what phone it is and what operating system it has different information. Um, but when you upload it to YouTube, you lose some of that. Um, that's a whole technical kind of side thing. But the easiest way is for us just to remember, take time off of our phone and film location. And then the next step is ideally we're what? We're working in a team, yeah, a, team a collective, a collaboration of great individuals. And so what we want to do is we actually want for us to film each other to get our location. That helps verify where we're at and what our angle of footage. There's a great... Um, and it's on our blog, but um, about in, in occupied territories, using forensic evidence of video to pinpoint uh, what was a gentleman being killed through video by that tactic of giving different people so you can pinpoint exactly where they're at. GPS wasn't available at that in that instance. Um, so that's really important, right? Now, the other thing that I just want to encourage is if you come in late or early to video, record into the video what you've seen, what you've heard, what's happening, why, why is there a commotion? You can say, I just got here, the police are arresting people, I don't know, this is what I don't know, but this is what I do know. And that's a huge resource, because then other people that are working in, uh, with the media can have a good sense of where that is. And by putting the date, time, and location, you're gonna be able to help us correlate all this information and make it easier to turn it around. Does that make sense? I don't hear any concern about what on cop shows I guess would be called chain of custody where you know could like I don't hear you talking about like archiving the video in any particular way date stamping it hashing it apparently those are not concerns we don't need to worry about any of that uh, well, okay let me go back to the importance of the monopod no I'm joking that's a yeah what, what you're getting to is the real <laughs> it's the real problem and there's work that's being done on this. The key question here is, we have a plethora of footage. We have the same angle from 40 different mobile phones, but we don't have a distance angle off it. We have um, the same shaky footage, but we don't have stable footage or aerial footage, right? But bottom line, all that content is going up online. Unless you're part of the working group, many people and citizens, they're not doing some simple things to help us find it. What would those things be when we put it up on YouTube, for example? Naming and tagging. Naming and tagging, right? Location, date, time, what happened before, during, and after. All those things. Now, why is that important? Well, if you want to archive it, you've got to have that information. Otherwise, it's not going to be useful, right? And also, if you're willing to be contacted, you've got to share it so people can contact you if they're working for the evidentiary or the archive. So how important is it to provide an email address or some way for, like, um, um, National Lawyers Guild order to get back to me so I can be an actual witness. Yeah, the recommendation. Very important. The recommendation now is if you have video footage, right, that um, is capturing something that you deem important, then clearly there are two main ports of call, right? One is the legal team; they should know about it. 
Um, and the way that you know, I've been told is you can call them and say, here's the date, time, location, the arrest, ideally the name of the people arrested. I have video footage. You can contact me here, right? Second, of course, is the Occupy Wall Street media team. They're doing an amazing job and working in a myriad of ways, but what's going to help them find them? Tag it, date, time, and location, because they're already searching online to find that stuff. Um, but you can contact them to support that effort. Um, has anybody encountered any challenges um, when filming that have been really difficult to deal with? Um, um, low light. Low light? Great. Any other challenges? Yep. The other thing is, you can have at night, if you're doing early morning actions, you can actually have flashlights um, that you can use to capture and hold alongside your camera. The flashlights that have gradation of light are fantastic. The iPhone has an application that's free, so you can have an iPhone along with your camera and have soft light to help light the situation. It's a very simple lo-fi way, but it's, it works really good. Um, you know, filming cops, this is a really, you guys know what the tarot cops are? Yeah. Tarot cops. This kind of, uh, this group of cops are responsible for monitoring cop behavior and giving feedback on their formations and how they're organized. Well, that's fantastic, but the thing about it is they often are recording when they shouldn't be recording. They're allowed to record when police are moving in a certain way for that purpose, not to do surveillance. So if you see it, then certainly, and if they're coming up on you, you should certainly report them. And you should report the date, time, location, the officer number, and ask for that officer number. Yeah, this, um, they're this, likely, this stuff is they're likely to not give any footage that's going to hurt your case. So if you film them, filming, then ensuring that they're, you're going to uh, protect <coughs> your rights. Are there ways that we should be careful of, like, the fact that are so, wow, this is so good. You guys are like hitting on all the real sensitive topics. Uh, okay, so on that, everyone has to make their own judgment, right? Um, what I've done with content that might um, be sensitive is when we're putting things online, one thing to remember is once it goes online, we've lost control over that content forever. So, for example, if someone is getting victimized, do we want to re-victimize that person? through that being shared. That's an ethical consideration. Um, if we maybe want to blur faces before we upload it, we you know, need to consider that. In order to really take the, the, the precautions of what you're getting to is asking for legal advice uh, before sharing. I think what we're seeing with the Occupy movement is there's, and this is, I work with Syrian activists, Egyptian activists, it's universal. It's the goal is to get it up now, to have a media to and live streaming is a great example of that. But some footage we want to take precaution, be strategic, and also if we take a little bit of time and edit it and you know put in text like date, time, location, this is what happened. That video is much more useful um, for advocacy or for raising awareness or mobilizing people. Because um, if you don't have that context, it's just another video. Um, all right, everybody with me? All right. Here's our friendly, the, the proverbial green line of demonstration, right? The, the police officer is just been... Okay. <laughs> All right, so the police officers, this is what you see, right? They're not moving, okay? So, round one, these are demonstrators. The tension is kind of low. What would we want to do right now? If I was... Uh, if I was a filmmaking team of three, where would I want three people? Yeah. I so, one over here. Yeah. One other end. Yeah. Uh, one back and above. One in the, in yeah. the building above okay. looking down at the top. <laughs> That's right. So, dream team scenario. You've got somebody from a higher vantage point getting the entire scene, right? Reality check in New York, you probably have somebody able maybe to hop on something. The other thing you can do if you're willing to lose $10 is to get a step ladder. Bring a step ladder, don't use it until a critical moment pop up and you're gonna get a higher angle. If they come and they take it, they take it, you lose $10. That's not a bad investment, just saying. Um, so one person is getting the full breadth, right? Second person potentially is either at a side angle or 
know the location, they're getting back here the formation and activity of the police from behind. This is where you're really going to see what's happening. And when you see people get picked off up the line, say, I'm a police officer, right? You know, this action, which we're seeing, who's had that happen to them or seen it? It's a lot. That's what we're seeing. That, that person loses it after he gets pulled. If I'm up here filming here, I lost it because it's not my frame. The only person that's going to have it in the frame is from back here. And that person's going to get some key information. They're going to cap. Yes, there's a key right there. <laughs> 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 you know what I'm All types yeah. of covert. I love it. <laughs> right. This, this behavior, when you're getting pulled back, he's going to get three main things. One, he's going to, or she's going to capture whether or not, come back over here, please. If he or she did anything to provoke, we're going to capture that. If they did it, and there was no, no physical touch, nothing in the pockets, which is noted earlier, no preconceived notion that that is an applicable move. So if he's taken, you're getting not only whomever other cops are involved, but you're getting the opportunity to capture the full arrest, the names of the cops ideally, badge numbers, and that's going to help because how would you have the badge number of this cop meaning me? Anyone? You already did it before. You already did it before. So the third person is up close. This is person who's willing to risk arrest or have a higher willing to be engaged in that way. They've gone step by step and got what on camera and on voice. Last name of the officer, is that visible also? What's that? Is the last name of the officer also available? The what? The last name of the officer. It's only the last name. It is the last name. It's not just the first name. First name is the last name. And you know, the, the most important thing, um, often pronouncing, pronouncing badge numbers or you get reflection, say the badge number. That's like, you can always get a cop from the badge number. Last name is a little bit more challenging. Yeah. I have a question about privacy here. True. Well, private security, this is like when you go to Afghanistan or Iraq with, you know, however, in Blackwater, it's the same challenge here. You know, you can't, you can't control it. If they have no obligation, they're not, you know, uh, we're not changing their salary. Um, so the best thing you do is try to capture whatever, you know, documentation you can. Can I get you to help out as well? Okay. No, no, it's okay. So, police officers, if you can please push us back. This happens a lot, right? We're getting pushed back. This is just a summation. If I'm filming, up right here. Okay, right here. How many of you have seen a bunch of people record like this? Quite a few, right? All this video camera is getting is one or two pops in the back of this person's head. That's it. You're not getting that much useful footage, I would say. Now, if you piece together all the footage, you might be getting some, but I'll tell you what's a lot better. Having your team member over here, in back here, but also stepping back and capturing as much as you can. But even better is when you have a monopod and you can get aerial footage and you can be at a distance so you're not getting shaky footage. Does this make sense? Yeah. So I'm just recapping what we talked about earlier, but I think it's super, super important. And the other aspect is if we're in a big crowd, we're working in a team, I have somebody looking out for me and helping me just on the keeping my back and moving people so I can get out and keep getting footage and not getting shaky footage. Are there any questions or ideas that people would want to toss out while we're all gathered together? Oh, um, just make sure you know how much space you have on your phone. <laughs> Memory. Yeah. Memory. Memory. Batteries. 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 Also, if you're doing live streaming on a phone, they have external battery packs, like backup battery packs that come in really handy. I was shooting live stream for over three hours at the Brew College walkouts. It came in really useful.
But so my comment was about going ahead of time to an office building, presenting yeah. them with the idea that you want to come into their space and film from their floor. That's different than being on the street with a badge. Like you can use a badge tactically in situations for people to think that you're as legitimate as you are. So I want to thank y'all for making time to join us. Thank you for coming uh, out here. Yeah, oh, it's so nice. Um, Thanks for actually for organizing this and bringing us in. Um, you know, we, you guys might have seen this. This is uh, 10 tips for filming Occupy Wall Street, especially for police brutality abuse. It has a lot of the stuff we covered. And then on the back, it has those key questions that came up around archiving and preserving, but how to tag it so people can find it, including lawyers. Um, so what I love is, I'll just set these over here, but if you'd be willing to grab some, when you see someone filming, especially on D17, to pass it to them. You know, you all might have this information, but a lot of people are getting involved, and it's fantastic. Um, so please share those if you would. The other thing is the Occupy Wall Street media team put up a blog post today that's really good on how to start live stream. So it's what applications you can install, how to get started, how to tag it so they can find it. Um, if you have a smartphone, I can't encourage you enough to really consider live streaming. It's the best. It's off the uh, Global um, Revolution. Uh, and I don't know what the exact link is. <laughs> so isn't live streaming, isn't that going to be much poorer quality than like filming HD on an iPhone? Oh yeah, that's a great point. I mean, the main thing is, if we're working in teams, you can also diversify the kind of equipment you're using. A photographer, a live stream, yeah. and a videographer. Um, like, many of us don't have high quality cameras, but we have smartphones. If you have smartphones, you can live stream. And the thing when you live stream is you can set it to high quality, and it'll save high quality that you can upload later when you get through Wi Fi. Oh. So it captures good, but in real time it might be spotty. Um, Bamboozer has a real good service for that. I tend to use that one. Um, but you know, just you can try it out. If you have a high quality camera, then I would advise one, you use it, but two, you also consider being someone that's at a distance, utilizing the power of the zoom instead of being with a small flip camera phone capturing details. Um, that's my recommendation. Um, okay, any last?